Good evening. Good evening. I want to thank Baltimore Police Commissioner Harrison for being here, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs for organizing this meeting, and all the organization and advocates that are here to support our immigrant community. Public safety and the role of the local police has become an important topic of discussion over the last few days. Is anybody interpreting? Is anybody interpret? Oh, yeah, right now. It's happening. Okay. Um, public safety and the role of local police has become an important topic of discussion over the last few days. The announcement by the federal government to increase enforcement in Baltimore has created a lot of fear in our communities. Mass di di okay, I'm waiting. We have. We have interpretation on channel 11. Tenemos interpre interpretación en el canal 11. Canal 1. Canal 1. Canal 1. Channel 1. Sorry. It's, it's going through a piece. Of okay. All right. Mass deportation aren't practical and cost our community valuable resources. We lose vital tax revenue. Local industry are disrupted. Schools become crisis centers and children who are separated from their parents end up in foster care. Baltimore has worked long and hard to strengthen the institution so our schools are safe places where children can learn. Law enforcement foster trust with the community and is well positioned to protect those in need regardless of immigrate, immigrant status and our economy function as a vibrant engine for growth regardless of where you were born. Maintaining the stability of our institution and the trust and confidence of our community requires our residents to have faith their rights will be protected. Baltimore City is safest when our neighbors trust their officials and institutions and know they will be treated justly and with dignity. You can clap. You can clap for that. <laughs> we need common sense solutions that focus on keeping our community safe and preserve the trust our residents have in law enforcement and local systems. If our residents don't feel safe, for example, coming forward to report crimes and cooperate with law enforcement, all of us are at more risk. That is why I want to thank Police Commissioner Harrison for his leadership on this matter. I know this is a difficult time, but as mayor, I am committed. As mayor, I am committed. As mayor, I am committed to do everything I can do to ensure that our, all of our residents, including immigrants and refugees, feel safe and know that they are valued and belong in our city. I want to close by reminding Baltimore City residents that they have access to an attorney if they have been detained by ICE. I want these <laughs> access to legal assistance provides an opportunity for our residents to tell their story with the proper legal counsel in front of the immigration judge. I'm proud that Baltimore is committed to upholding the American values of respecting the rights and dignity of our residents. Regardless of the position of the federal government, we will continue to stand by our decision to be an inclusive, fair, and welcoming city. I'm going to say that again. Regardless of the position of our federal government, we will continue to stand by our decision to be an inclusive, fair, and welcoming city. And I want to thank you all for being here. And I want to let you know that we, I'm not just saying words to be saying words. We're committed because, like I said before, the only naturalized American citizens are the American Indians. So we're all immigrants, if you want to look at it that way. The only real naturalized American citizens are the Native American Indians. With that, I just want to thank you. I have a, what you call it, a um, block party to be at. At six, I can't be in two places at one time, but I know that Commissioner Harrison is here and he will follow up on the commitment that I just made that we're not going to be cooperating with ICE on any level. So I want to make that clear. Thank you.
Thank you, Mayor Young. Uh, our work wouldn't be possible without your support and your leadership. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to MIMA and the community. My name is Catalina Rodriguez Lima, and I am the director of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Um, please know that this meeting is being interpreted to Spanish via simultaneous interpretation. Um, MIMA and the Community is a biannual event organized by our office. The purpose of the meeting is to provide information regarding policies, services, and resources impacting new Americans in Baltimore City. Today's topic, public safety and immigrant communities, captures our work with Baltimore police to ensure that our policies and services are sensitive to the needs of our population. This means building trust between local law enforcement and new Americans, providing a safe space for immigrants to report crime without the fear of being arrested due to immigrant status, and maintaining the stability of public institutions to ensure that our residents know their rights will be protected. It means focusing on public safety threats and not on our neighbors. This is particularly important given the federal administration's efforts to increase immigration enforcement and its recent announcements highlighting Baltimore as a target city. These efforts have, poten have the potential to erode trust between local law enforcement and new Americans while creating a lot of panic in communities documented and not. I would like to thank the police commissioner and his department for not only listening to the requests of the community, but also putting policies in place to ensure that new Americans are treated justly and with dignity. On that note, I would like to turn it over to Commissioner Harrison. But before I do that, I would like to ask the audience to hold questions until the end, where we will have an opportunity to answer those. Thank you and, and good evening. I'm certainly uh, happy to see all of you. Thank all of you for being here. I'm certainly proud to serve under this mayor uh, and to honor and be a part of this team and this commitment. I want to reaffirm to all of you that the Baltimore Police Department's commitment to protecting and serving all of Baltimore's immigrant community regardless of immigration status. We are always and will always be committed to serving and protecting everybody in Baltimore. Our officers will not ask about immigration status or citizenship under any circumstances. I want to assure you that every contact that you have with members of the Baltimore Police Department, it will not lead to an immigration inquiry because we are not immigration police. That's not the mission of the Baltimore Police Department. That's the work of ICE and that is a federal enforcement and should be done by the federal employees. Baltimore Police, we work to reduce criminal activities, but we work to do that in every community. Our immigrants who are victims and who happens to be, happen to be witnesses to crimes, they can help us do our work. But you can't help us do that work if you're afraid to call, if there's fear of deportation or fear of getting arrested. We can't know exactly how many crimes are actually being permitted if we don't have the information from you about crimes that you're being victimized on or witnesses to. Our police officers are committed to strengthening the bonds in our city through constitutional policing and fair and impartial policing. We rely on the members of the community to improve public safety, not to separate us from public safety. We recognize ID cards issued now by churches and other government and non-government organizations. At one time we didn't do that, now we will. But let me be clear, that is not in the absence of a driver's license because a driver's license is still required to drive a motor vehicle. Any other ID forms that we accept will only be for people who are not driving a police vehicle. I'd like you to see our police policy. It's policy 1021. It's on our website and it describes our policies in this area. It's developed in conjunction with our consent decree partners and it is actually modeled after a policy that I helped to write when I was the chief in New Orleans a, a few years ago. And the people who helped write this said it was modeled in New Orleans, home of the saints. But I'm not going to say home of the saints. <laughs> it was modeled in New Orleans, home of the first biggest consent decree. And now we now have the biggest and most robust consent decree. So here it is. We work with all law enforcement agencies, local, federal, and state agencies. But we do not cooperate or collaborate with ICE. Our personnel are not enforcing 
immigration law. In keeping with the law, we will not detain or arrest any individual based on, solely on a, uh, a violation of an administrative warrant or any other immigration violation. Only the application of criminal law is what we are dealing with and only violations of criminal law we will enforce. I happen to be now for a couple of years a member of the National Law Enforcement Immigration Task Force. It is a task force of very progressive police chiefs and other leaders around the country who really want to focus on real policies that help police departments and help cities. And oftentimes, we're kind of pushing against and talking against some of the national policies that are coming out because we understand as chiefs and as law enforcement executives what we really need in our communities to make them safe and to keep them safe. And sometimes there are policies that are contrary to what we know makes us safe. And so that organization that I've now been a member of and I remain a member even though now I'm the commissioner here in Baltimore, I'm joined with other major city chiefs around the country to make sure we create the right kind of policies, the right kind of protocols, and the right kind of practices that gives everyone dignity and respect and makes our community safe. And so I will not give you a long speech because I really wanted to reserve our time for answering a, a few questions that I think you have for me tonight. And once again, thank you for being here tonight. And if you can just join me on the podium. We have a, a couple of questions from some of our community advisory boards. Um, the Hispanic Advisory for Public Safety and MEMA's Community Advisory Board uh, meet on a bi-monthly basis and inform the work that MEMA uh, carries out. So I'm going to ask them to come to the podium based on the questions that were created by both groups. Has a long history as a welcoming city for immigrants, and we're truly to see the next step in strengthening that position. And we know that a critical factor in the implementation of this policy will be training of uh, BPD and call centers operators of the policy, both during initial implementation and on continuous basis. What are your plans for ensuring robust training program? Thank you for that. Great question. So first of all, we wanted to meet with you. We've finished the policy. It has been vetted and approved by members of our team and members of the Department of Justice and of course the consent decree monitoring team and approved by them. So now we wanted to meet with the community to be able to have a conversation. <clears throat> excuse me, now we're working on, <clears throat> excuse me, rolling out training to all the members of our department based on this policy so that every member of our department understands what they can and what they cannot do, what they should and what they should not do so that everybody is clear and then we can create other training and our discipline for those who we find will violate that policy. So now we can go out and begin training all the members of our department. But it is about strict accountability. So when it is brought to our attention, and it's brought to our attention and we know about it, when it happens, where it happens, if a member of our department is violating that policy, we know how to take the appropriate action. And then for supervisors who know that these violations are occurring, I need to know what they're doing about it so that there can be measures of accountability for supervisors who fail to take the appropriate action. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Yolani. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to be asking the second question. Okay. Even with, even with good policies, in order to establish trust and faith in the policy, we need to ensure that police officers and call center operators are held accountable to these standards. How will you hold officers and operators accountable to, to ensuring that the policy is implemented and what steps will you take if you learn that an officer is contacting ICE based on administrative warrant and not authorized by this policy? So great question again. And that's about training and retraining and retraining. And then checking on our people and conducting audits and inspections and evaluations to make sure not only that people know the policy, but we're actually practicing the policy in the field. So I, I think that's part one. Part two, making sure there's strict accountability. So like I told the young lady, when it is brought to our attention, and we can only know it when, when you tell us, when it's brought to our attention that a member of our department is violating the policy, there are a few things we can do. There's body camera footage, there's information from the dispatcher, and there are other ways we can investigate that to make sure we hold our people accountable and they're retrained and disciplined when appropriately when we find that they're violating our policy. But it's going to be with inspections and audits where we go and check on our people to make sure they're doing it right.
but other meetings like this one, like I'm here tonight, there are other community meetings and other ways to find out if we are performing the way you expect us to perform or the way we're supposed to perform according to our policy. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioner. Good evening. Hi, my name is Paul. I'm with Esperanza Center. And I want to thank you for being here. I think we all want to thank you very much for being here. Thank you, sir. Um, in light of the recent announcements by President Trump, I would like to ask um, what strategies is the police department doing to ensure that members of the community are not afraid to report crime, to contact the police department? Great question. I think the, the beginning of the strategy is me coming to make a commitment to you and our mayor coming to make a commitment to you that's very public, that's televised. Secondly, by making sure you're connected to our supervisors and our rank in our districts where you're informed in real time at our community meetings that you can attend at our station, but invitations by you to us to attend community meetings to always keep you informed as to what's going on. But to make a commitment to you that through our policy, we remain committed and focused on providing public safety and only enforcing criminal law and not administrative law. And by putting all of this online for you to view online, anytime you want to look at our policy, once it's uploaded, you'll be able to look at our policy and know everything about it and read it. And when it is brought to our attention, we'll be very transparent about what we're doing when we find that people are violating our policy. But after the training, giving the instructions to the officers, we'll, we're more than happy to share with you through community collaboration the instructions we're giving our officers regarding what they should and shouldn't do, because it's really laid out pretty robustly in the policy. Thank you. The, the transparency, it sounds so great. I do have a part two to this question. Um, we know that recently in Howard County, um, federal authorities contacted them. Have the federal authorities contacted the Baltimore City Police Department? And um, if not, what would the department do? If they, were, you know, they have not contacted me. And I'm unaware that anybody else in my department has been contacted. And that's something that we check on. But I can say that there, there are some jurisdictions outside of the city police that operate their own jail. I do believe that county operates its own jail. So in some instances, they will contact departments, especially those that operate their jail, because the jail is a part of the, de the detention process and the second part of the arrest process. And so they have not contacted us. In the event that they do, we will follow our policy and make sure that we are clear that we are not participating in immigration enforcement. And we will ensure that our members are redirected and re-instructed about following the policy. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Harrison. Good evening. In the past, Baltimore Police had dedicated officers to provide community education to ethnic communities in their language. The officers shared information about safety tips how to call police, information about P BPD uniform badges, and more. Will you, Mr. Harrison, continue to practice on having dedicated officers to educate the immigrant community about the role of local police and help them navigate through the department? Great question. I will remain committed to making sure we have dedicated police to make sure there are liaisons to specific communities, for example, the Hispanic community. I had a meeting uh, last week with uh, HALEA, the, the Hispanic Law Enforcement Organization. They met with me in my office and brought up that very same question. And so there was a liaison, one person, who had an assignment in police headquarters, but as a matter of deployment strategy, we redeployed detectives back to districts. And that one person was redeployed back to a district assignment to be a detective. But it's still the liaison to the Hispanic community. What I want is for every member of our department to be a community policing officer and not rely on any one officer. And so what I told my Hispanic officers who were in our meeting last week, I need more than one person to step up to be engaged and to be liaisons so that we're not relying on one person. But there are, more, there are many people who can do that. And secondly, um, this may come up later, but we want to make sure that we are attracting more people from our city who are Hispanic to be members of our police department. And then we want to deploy them equally across our department so that they are in every facet of our police department working on every shift. 
so they're available to be a liaison to you, not just once a week, but perhaps all the time. Thank you for servicing Baltimore. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioner. Good evening. My name is Viviana. I'm with Talkery Justice Center. My question is two parts. Okay. Um, over the last few years, the department has taken steps to minimize language barriers, for which we are very grateful. This is particularly important in domestic violent cases, violence cases where the perpetrator will oftentimes translate for the victim. You know, to give a little example of this, uh, in my office we had a client who she had reported to the police six or seven times, and each time the police would come and just speak specifically to her assailant. And so they just kept taking down whatever he said, and he kept coming up, he kept coming up with excuses as to why she was hurt, even when she was bleeding from her head. Um, she finally went in person to the police department, and luckily then she was able to report, and everything was taken down, um, and she was able to put this man behind bars. But of course, for many victims, immigrant victims, it's especially hard to come forward and do more than just one report, especially when their um, assailant is telling them, you don't have any power, uh, you don't have a voice, you are not the one that speaks English, so you will never be listened to. So this is very important for the community. <clears throat> Uh, will you support language access policies already established? Absolutely. We have that, and I will continue to support that. It's actually a pay incentive for officers who speak a second language, namely Spanish. And what I want to do is what I just told the previous person asking a question, is expand the number of Spanish-speaking officers that we have in our department that come into our department, and that we can find a way to equitably deploy those officers throughout the different parts of the city so that, so that on any given day and on any given time of day there are Spanish speaking officers available to go to those scenes to interpret and be able to, to get to the truth a lot faster so that justice can be served. So that's a priority for all, for all of us. Wonderful. So then you're saying you commit to ensuring that this program with the bilingual officers is sustained and properly funded? I am committed to it. I'm, com I'm committed to making sure that it is sustained, and I'm committed to fighting for funding for other people who have to give the money to us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Immigrant populations continue to grow in the city of Baltimore. The department assigned officers based on language skills and cultural background to match those of the community on the ground. So, repeat that for me again now. <laughs> With immigrant populations continue to grow in the city of Baltimore, will the department assign officers based on language skills, and cultural background, yeah. to match those of the community on the ground? Yeah, that's very similar, and, and the answer to that is yes. And so it is, it is my goal and our goal as a police department to have the kind of deployment strategy that gives fair and equitable deployment of all resources across the city so that as, as this population grows and we begin to have more Spanish-speaking officers come into our department and stay longer in our department, we want to make sure that that disbursement of Spanish-speaking officers is equitable and fair and evenly dispersed around the city so that at any given day and any given time, the hope is to always have someone who can interpret and translate available to go to a scene or to take the lead of an investigation. And so that, that is our goal. So we want to make sure we sustain that. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. At this point, uh, we're going to open the floor uh, to questions that were not uh, mentioned by our members. Any hands? If you can come to the mic, please. Resources to address it. 
So as the mayor mentioned, Baltimore City residents may have access to an attorney if they're arrested by ICE. We actually work with CARE Coalition, and the members are here on the back. Um, and so what they essentially do is they go to the detention centers, which are not located in the city of Baltimore, and look for Baltimore City residents to be able to provide access to counsel. In our opinion, that is the ultimate line of defense for our constituents to be able to give them an opportunity to go to the judge and tell their story with uh, an attorney. So if someone is, and, and they would call you, you the number you're giving us, and we have... We have a very, very nice uh, one pager that explains who to call and when to call and what to collect. And we have copies in English and Spanish outside. And someone will go right to the detention center and be the, the organization is in the detention centers. Yes. Thank you. thank You're you welcome. For doing that and thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, hi, Commissioner. I want to uh, thank you in the name of all the people of Baltimore for coming up here from New Orleans to Baltimore to try to help us set things straight. Thank you. And I think we all know, everybody who's lived, I've been here for 35 years, same house, same neighborhood. One of the problems is uh, a lot of the police don't live in Baltimore. I mean, they go back to Trump country. <laughs> yeah. How can we get, you know, some kind of statute or rule that the police officers and the firemen and other public servants should live in the city? I mean, it's a big deal. You know? Thank you. It, it is. And it's always important. We are working now on a recruitment campaign that will target people from Baltimore to be attracted to this police department so that we can re recruit more people from the city of Baltimore into our police department. That's always a concern, but we are always working to recruit, hire, and train the absolute best people. And with the recruiting challenges of the country, every city in America is facing recruiting shortages in every city in America. Every city in America is facing recruiting challenges, and we're all fighting for the same small pool of acceptable, qualified candidates, whether they're from in the city or whether they're from anywhere in America. Uh, but right now, it's a small percentage of individuals who work for the department, who live in the department. Um, we're working to make sure we find the best candidates, where, wherever they may be from. Ideally, it would be a great, a great thing for all of our people to be living in the city. It's just, not, it's just not realistic in the environment we live in because every city in America has the same challenge. All right. When I started, I was talking to our questions and questions. Thank you for your time and thank you for being here to answer our questions. Thank you. My question is, I live Uh, muchos de nosotros los inmigrantes vivimos a los límites de la ciudad de Baltimore, pero nos desarrollamos en la ciudad de Baltimore. Many people in the immigrant community live right on the city limits, but they develop uh, in the Baltimore city. Muchos hemos sido víctimas de, de asaltos y de otras situaciones en la ciudad de Baltimore. ¿Qué garantía tenemos nosotros para poder ser protegidos, así sea que, no vi, que nuestra residencia no sea entre los límites de la ciudad de Baltimore? She said that many people in the immigrant community are often victims of crime, victims of assault, and she wants to know... Okay. So she says that she lives right on the county line, but she wants to know how she will be protected within the city limits if she is a victim of a crime. Well, there are patrol strategies that we have all over the city, especially in the neighborhoods that are in the city, even if they're close to the county line. We want to make sure that if a crime is committed inside the city, it's investigated, we respond to it with a city police officer and we investigate it with one of our detectives. If it is across the county line or if there is some connection between our city police department and the county police department that we can work in collaboration on that because there may be some connectivity between the city and the county. Those relationships are already there and we're working on that every day, you know, right now. We can always work to improve it But if it is inside the city where you're a victim, we are responding to it and we are working to investigate it to make sure justice is served. 
Muchísimas gracias por contestar mi pregunta. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome to Highland Town Commission. Thank you. Um, how difficult is it to get the uh, trust of a vulnerable community like immigrants when throughout Baltimore there's a general perception that the police are not trustworthy, whether you're an immigrant or if you were born here? That's, that's very difficult, and it takes time. It starts with the commitment from our mayor, who stood right here and made a commitment and who gave you his, his attention and his word. Starts with me, the commissioner, being here making a commitment. It starts with my commitment to a strong policy that this community would, would agree with and support, that the Department of Justice agrees with and support. And it, it starts with then training our police officers. So it, it is very, very difficult, but it can be done, and it's done over time, but it is in, it's in collaboration with the community. But it all starts with community engagement just like this. And then we do this over and over again in this community, at our police stations, in other communities. And when our officers are trained, and then over time, we all begin to see the value of building relationships and the value of getting information from immigrant communities that otherwise would not have given it to us. When, when our officers begin to see that firsthand for themselves, it, it begins to get better, but it does take time and it's challenging. But we're already underway and a big portion of what we're doing is already done. The policy was a, a really hard thing, but now that's done, now it's time to train the officers. And what they really want is clear direction on what to do. Hmm? You were brought here because you had um, significant success in New Orleans. Is Baltimore a tougher challenge than New Orleans, which we're somewhat similar, but not completely similar. There, there, there are many similarities. It is a bigger city. It is, there, there are more, you know, it's a larger city with a bigger population. There's more, there are more dynamics to, to what has happened. And what we did in New Orleans, you know, came out of a, a Department of Justice investigation in 2012. And so now years have passed, and now here we are going through the very same thing. And so there are a lot of lessons learned in America that we can apply here. So it may not be as hard as it was then. And yeah, and, and the chief before me in New Orleans and then I, that was our first time dealing with this. So this is not our first time for some of us here in Baltimore, yeah, but for the leadership team that we have, this is not really our first time. And so the lessons were learned. That's why the policy was somewhat, though it was hard, it was somewhat easier and, you know, the, the mayor's commitment is, is genuine, mine's genuine, and we're happy to be here. And I think the more we do this and the more people feel comfortable giving us information and we demonstrate through our actions that we're not asking about Im immigration status, that will transcend time and places and people, and people will become, become to feel more comfortable over time. We need, we need help. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Eva. Good evening, my name is Eva. Good evening. Yo tengo una pregunta. Hace un tiempo a una amiga le robaron su carro. Cuando ella despertó, se dio cuenta de eso. Um, I have a question. A few weeks ago, or a while ago, I had a friend who her car was stolen. And she woke up in the morning, she realized her car was gone. Ella llamó a la policía, como se debería de hacer. Y la policía lo que hizo fue llamar a ICE. She called the police like she was supposed to do, and then that police officer contacted ICE. ¿Qué garantía tengo yo, que no vivo en la ciudad, de llamar a la policía por un caso similar y no me pase lo mismo? What assurances do I have, even if I live in the county, that if I call the police, they will not contact ICE? I, great question, and, I, and that was not supposed to happen. Now that we have this policy, we're going to train our officers. If you find that that has happened, that needs to be reported to me. And so I cannot guarantee that every officer will do the right thing. When it is brought to my attention, I can guarantee that I will do the right thing to make sure that people are trained and people are disciplined when we know about it. And so we have to know about it. So in that event, you need to ask for a supervisor or you need to ask for the highest ranking person working and make that information known because there are ways we can find out if a person is violating our policy and then we can hold them accountable. But it is something that we have to know 
And, and it is something now that we have this policy, it's something that we want to know. Okay. De mientras, mientras pasa todo lo que usted me acaba de decir, uno es arrestado. ¿Qué puede uno hacer? She said, while all of this is going on, everything that you're saying to me, uh, if I'm arrested, what can I do? You can ask to speak to one of our supervisors, and if you make it known that you want to speak to a supervisor, or if you can file a complaint with our Public Integrity Bureau, we will come to wherever you are, and we will take that investigation. We'll take that complaint, we will take that investigation. But somehow, we have to know, either you or somebody close to you has to be able to let us know. And when we find that after we train our officers and make them aware of that policy, when they violate it, there are consequences for that. But we have to know there has to be an investigation. So if you can't, somebody close to you has to be able to get the information to us really quickly so that we can act on it really quickly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just very quickly, sorry. Very quickly, um, we also have Darnell Ingram, who's the director of the Civil Rights Office, uh, where individuals can also make a complaint against the police department. <laughs> Um, we have we have time for one more question, and then we're gonna go ahead and uh, wrap up. So hmm. two, two more. Two, I think yes. it's six four. Yes. Uh, so I just wanted to ask if, in the policy, it lays out what those consequences will be for officers who violate the policy. How are we going to hold them accountable besides people making a complaint? So that policy does not talk about the consequences, but there is there's an entire disciplinary process with a disciplinary matrix that, that spells out discipline for officers who violate minor policy, minor violations, medium violations, or major violations, whether it's their first time, second time, or third time. And those investigations that then when we put the disciplinary matrix, when we find out whether it's a minor or major or intermediate violation, first, second, third, or fourth time, that tells us what level of discipline to give. And so while it doesn't spell out what happens, there, 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 there is an investigation, there will be consequences, but it depends on what the officer did, how many times the officer did it, how many times have they violated that policy or, or other policies in the past. That kind of leads us to what the correct discipline should be. Okay, real quick, uh, if someone violates it for the first time, is that considered a minor violation? We don't, I don't have the answer to that right now. Okay. And so we, we built the policy, now we have training, now we have to figure out what's an appropriate discipline for that and how egregious is it. Right. Thank you. Just to add to uh, Commissioner Harris's statement, yeah. I'm the director for the Office of Civil Rights and Wage Enforcement, and one of the agencies uh, my office oversees is the Civilian Review Board. In that particular situation, when you have complaints against the police department, you can independently file a complaint with our office where we investigate that matter with the police. If it under specified reasons, but even if we're unable to, in the event of the investigation, we'll re uh, provide a recommendation to the commissioner for discipline, which he may consider and discipline the officer. If it doesn't follow, fall under our authority, what we do as constitu constituency services, we will work with our residents or citizens mm -hmm. or immigrant uh, community members or uh, residents to walk them through the process, ensure that their complaint is heard independently of the police officer, they, so we can ensure that people complaints are being justified, I mean, um, followed through in uh, the police department. So that's something that we're providing for um, our community members here in Baltimore City. Uh, good evening, Commissioner Good evening, good evening. Uh, so my name is uh, Nicholas Machado. I represent the Children's Medical Practice at Johns Hopkins Bayview. Uh, so my question was, within the city of Baltimore especially, and of course all around the United States, one of the rising issues is the escalation of force in interactions with police officers, especially among uh, minority communities. And my question for you is regarding the accountability trainings that are going to be implemented within the department, um, is there a large focus on de-escalation and preventing you know, these issues from occurring? And do we have your commitment that this is something that you, know, you as a commissioner will take very seriously uh, in the instances that they do come up in the future? Absolutely. First of all, let me answer the second one first. You absolutely have my, com my commitment. Uh, reform and transformation is exactly why I'm here. Um, and so you, you absolutely have my commitment. But yes, every course in our curriculum, and we're in the process of hiring an academic director 
to lead all training at our police academy. And so every course has a component of de-escalation to it because we want all of our members to be community policing minded. And so whether it is interacting with the Hispanic community, whether it's dealing with someone selling drugs, whether it's someone with a mental illness crisis, every training now that we're working to give is about minimizing uses of force and de-escalation so that we only have to use whatever force is necessary, none at all preferably. And so yes, de-escalation is a major component. Not only that, but we're working to bring another program to Baltimore that teaches officers how to intervene on behalf of their other officers when they see an officer escalating. So just like we see citizens escalate and we think we have to escalate, rather than us having to de-escalate on our own, we're, teaching, we're gonna teach each other how to de-escalate against each other. So when one police officer is becoming agitated, another can say, let me take over. So yes, that is, that is at the core of everything that we're doing so that we can de-escalate. That's part of relationship building. That's part of transformation and culture change. It's a lot to do. It's very hard to do, but we're committed to doing it. I appreciate the response. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Police Commissioner. Um, I would like to close by highlighting what the mayor mentioned at the beginning of the meeting. Baltimore City residents may have access to an attorney if they're arrested by ICE. This is part of a strategy called Safe City Baltimore, which funds five nonprofit organizations in Baltimore City to provide information about Know Your Rights, um, access to an attorney if you have not been detained, and access to an attorney if you have been detained. Uh, thank you, Police Commissioner, for your leadership on this matter. Our community. <laughs> our community is the safest when they know that their rights will be respected. Uh, thank you all for participating in MIMA and the community. <laughs> and if you want to learn about our office, events, and strategies, uh, we have our newsletter outside, or you can follow us on Facebook at MIMA at Baltimore City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice evening.